All right. We got uh, three after the hour here, guys. So I am going to go ahead and, and get us kick started here. I'm sure there'll be people joining uh, as we get, get started here. But um, uh, just as a reminder to everybody, this, this meeting, the webinar will be recorded and, and all of the registrants will automatically get sent the recording. Um, so yeah, let's let's go ahead and, and get things kicked off. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. Thank you for, for joining here and, and uh, welcome to another installment of the Revista webinar series. Um, I'm Greg Keller, North American Sales Director, and I'm joined here by uh, a guy who obviously needs no introduction, uh, our technical master, or maybe better known as Global Director of Customer Success, Brett Settles. Um, hey, everyone. So today's session will be extremely powerful um, as we focus on reality capture inside Revisto and kind of how it relates to and improves, uh, you know, the overall coordination process for your projects. Um, Brett is going to focus on demoing the technical aspects of our reality capture workflows. Um, we've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to, you know, we'll, we'll jump right in. Here's our super detailed agenda here. Uh, but again, because we've got so much uh, thing, so many things to, to cover from a technical standpoint, uh, we do want to. Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Make the majority of the the conversation uh, be centered around the product. Um, but just real quick, uh, you know, for those that may not be familiar with with what Revisto is. We are an integrated collaboration platform or ICP. And you know, there's lots of different things that I could probably say about what that means, but uh, you know, a few bullet points here that kind of <clears throat> describe what that is. Ultimately guys, it's, it, what it means is that we're a, an intelligent link between design software and project management software. You know, really bridging that gap and allowing all project team members a single centralized contextual environment uh, to, to review, to communicate, to coordinate, you know, really so that there are less gaps in your, your cross team collaboration, you know, resulting in faster and, and more efficient project delivery. Um, it, it really becomes the only place that all project players go for 2D, for 3D, for reality capture coordination, um, you know, and the last piece is obviously, like I said, what we're focusing on today. So um, without further ado, I'm going to kick it over to Brett Settles. Hey, everyone. Yeah, thanks for joining us today. And, and, and a few quick slides for me um, as we move on here. I, I think this one, while very generalized, is extremely important in that Scanning is something that used to be very expensive, very time consuming, very specialized back during the early days of our ability to do this. As you can see from 60, uh, you know, through from 1960 through the mid 90s, most of all of this was flown, you know, uh, uh, with a plane, right? Or some sort of of technology that required a lot of expensive hardware, a lot of, of specialized personnel to operate these things. As time has moved on, uh, things have gotten better. Now to, to reference this timeline a little bit, over on the left, you'll see that even though it looks like by 2006, we're making a lot of progress here, actually using reality capture in an AEC environment was still very, very difficult. In 2006, I had my first experience with flown LIDAR. And I literally had to convert it into a CSV, run that CSV through open database connectivity, use FME features with Map3D, and actually convert those to points that could be used in a civil engineering environment. Today, I can scan myself right now and with my iPhone and have it in a project here by lunchtime, right? Which is in about 50 minutes. So the availability for your everyday company to use this technology is increasing with every moment that passes. So we want to make sure that everyone's aware of, all right, we know that we can collect this cheaper, but how do we actually use it? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, perfect, right? Yeah, and I think that really speaks to um, where the real value comes in. You know, it's, it's great that uh, companies can, can capture this data, but what does it really mean downstream and, and 
how can they make the best use of it? And, and I ultimately, I think it really comes from being able to democratize the access to it, extend it out you know, easily to all project members and to allow them to really not only view it, but take action on it. And that's you know, a lot of what we'll focus on today. So uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, Brett, and we can get into kind of the live demonstration piece. Absolutely. So Greg, can you can you see everything okay? We are good. Awesome. So let's kind of start at the beginning of where the value of reality capture comes with Revisto. And you know, it really starts in a really, really sort of primitive way. And that is the fact that our scan and mesh data can be sent up to the cloud and shared to anybody that can download it through our proprietary format. Um, we do some compression here and all of that because we do know that people are using our product on lower end machines and sometimes even tablets. So the ability to bring in those scans and actually reduce their weight while still getting the same visual quality has been a huge value to all of our clients that are using this. Now, in addition to the ability to deliver this easier, and, and before I move on, you know, to explore that a little bit, I mean, there were points in my career where I, I literally put a point cloud on a hard drive and FedExed it to somebody. And I'm sure everyone in the room that's listening has probably done that before. Um, or the ability to get that, you know, open on a computer, that 16 gig file, all of that. Um, you know, that's where that delivery method comes into play. Now, when we talk about the actual files themselves, I'm going to open up our links dialog here, and you're going to actually see that we have two different formats in here of reality capture. We have the RCP and we have the FBX file. Um, the FBX file was created with a uh, meshing software known as Point Fuse, and the RCP is coming directly out of a scene export. So here you can immediately see one advantage, right? We have the same exact data set. We're not analyzing it in Revisto. We're using it for visual uh, coordination and communication. So here we have almost a 20 time reduction in file size by using a mesh. So keep in mind that not only do we have the ability to work with both, but there are some extreme benefits if you are uh, sophisticated enough in your reality capture process to generate these meshes. Hey, Brett, I now, want to stop you right there, if you don't mind. So a couple of questions around that. You know, I guess, number one, you know, how does delivering the, the scan, data, scan data via the cloud help that accessibility? And then also, you know, you, you make reference towards that mesh. How, how does that help teams coordinate? So if you can maybe talk to those points. Yeah, that's a really good point. So um, think about it this way, you know, Revisto is a, uh, a, a hybrid SaaS software. Um, point clouds in the past and the software that handles them is really very standalone, right? We have a file, we open that file with a software. This creates a situation where those people have to have the software, they have to have the file, they have to have access to the file through VPN or some other way. And this creates a lot of barriers to our ability to transfer it to certain people. At my old job, there were all sorts of times where a project manager would tap me on the shoulder and say, hey, I wanna see that point cloud, right? And in a lot of ways that was necessary at the time, but in, a, in also a lot of other ways, that's a huge waste of time because you have someone sucking up the resources of another person to do something that really should be easy. Now, on the mesh side of your question, Greg, um, <clears throat> the advantages to meshes and why they enhance coordination is that meshes are so light in size for the amount of data that they include that you can open it on a $900 two-in-one. You can open it on an iPad 11, um, not pro version, right? It really gains the teams the ability to use the information without throwing as much hardware at it. Right, and, and Brett, I, I think the other thing too with the mesh is, you know, you talk about allowing teams to, to take action on that stuff. The mesh to me seems a lot better of a, of a file format that allows them to do things like, 
you know, take, take measurements from, you know, pipe to wall or, or, you know, section cut that model, just much, much easier and more effective than maybe a traditional RCP file might be for that. So um, I think that would also play into it. Absolutely. And we'll actually talk about those differences when we get in there. So, um, yeah, you're exactly correct. I mean, the mesh doesn't have noise, right? So noise in point clouds is a big thing. And we actually have an example of that and how that can get in the way of the end user actually using this reality capture data. So I'll actually have an example for that. Um, yeah. yeah, so we also have the ability to switch between the scan and the mesh. So for example, if I jump back out here, you are seeing both in this situation. If I change my preset to mesh, what you will now see is, is that we are working with nothing but the actual 3D mesh. So it's actually a solid triangulated uh, network. And Greg, to your question, what's nice about the meshes is, is that they cut very clean. There's not a lot of noise. Everything is very crisp. Everything is very clear, right? Yeah, now, and I think what really speaks to that, Brett, too, from, from a, an, an observer here that everybody can see is that it, as soon as you switch to that mesh, your your screen sharing got a lot smoother. Everybody saw that very quickly and, and, and cleanly. So I think that certainly speaks to uh, you know how we're able to work with that. And and for those that are on the call new to Revisto, you know when Brett talked about being able to have that accessibility to data like this, easy access to it, you know the, the share button up up at the top of the actual application, uh, that's what allows us to to simply invite whoever we want to be involved in this project. So, you know, gone are the days of, of you know, like, like Brett said, FedExing, you know, certain things so that people could see what he's seeing. You know, you're talking about sharing this with people on the fly, allowing them to, to you know, download this on whatever device they want and have immediate access to it. Absolutely. Yeah, and, you know, to get to the point that you were talking about uh, or that I was talking about with the ability to use it, if we come in here and we change to a scan only, we're not gonna we're not gonna see anything different from what was captured point. But this is a good example of noise. See this? We had a scan, something must have happened to it, and now we've got a ton of noise going on. Now, this isn't really a problem with our software. There are multiple ways to get rid of this noise. There's post-processing your scans or generating those meshes. But this really kind of shows one of those uh, particular examples, right? So like for, you know, an end user wants to go try and measure, we've got all this noise kind of getting in that user's way, right? So we don't know exactly what we're measuring to. However, once we switch over to that mesh and we have the same view, that measurement I think becomes a little bit more clear. Now, point clouds will give you a little bit more detailed of a measurement if there is not noise. So for example, we come over here, we switch back to the scan and let's go over to an area that's been properly cleaned up. This is where we can do things and where an RCP may actually be more beneficial. A lot of it depends on what is your use case, right? right. Are we doing construction verification? Are we doing design coordination collaboration? A lot of it depends on that and how high of a quality your scan is. But there we can actually see a measurement directly on the RCP. So, yeah, and, th and this is powerful, Brett, for, you know, for people that really don't, that are not technical in some of the, you know, the typical software packages to, to have this easy access to, you know, sectioning and dimensioning in this. Fr from a coordination standpoint, you know, maybe talk to and, and show uh, creating the issue and allowing for those people to, you know, not only observe this data, but then to, to take further action on that for, you know, for these teams to, to uh, coordinate together. Yeah, absolutely. So, I like to always show two examples here, especially in a reality capture situation, right? So <clears throat> one would be um, 
you know, old equipment that's either being reused or needs recertified or needs inspected, right? So maybe we take a look at this uh, air handling. Uh, nope, actually, that's a liquid pump. But we'll take a look at it. And let's say that there's some sort of safety issue going on on site, right? We can simply go right here, say hazard identified, drop that right onto the existing condition. So now we're talking about communicating in the field with things that aren't even part of the model. We're talking about people being on site, understanding what's tagged out, what's not tagged out. Any of these sort of situations have to do with actually being there. Now, if we turn around, now we can start to look at, okay, well, what about in a design scenario, right? What, what are we dealing with there? And that's where we can come in and just start to actually see, all right, well, looks like we've got some problems over here with these existing conditions. And this doesn't even have anything to do with clash. I can say, oh, it looks like we need a design review right here. It's gonna create that issue and it's gonna automatically reveal what grid, what level in this particular project, I don't have room spaces or areas set up. But what you're actually seeing here is you're supplementing the scan with the intelligent BIM uh, data that is merged with the scan. Right, so all, right that, like, all that metadata automatically comes in and is part of that issue now. That's exactly correct. So it, even if I go to where I was before, right, that first issue, it has nothing to do with the model, but I still understand what grid it's at. I still understand what level, what room, every, everything where it is contained. So very, very powerful when you bring the models and the scan together, not just because you can see them together, but because you can interact with the information. Another Brad, example, oh, go ahead, Greg. Yeah, to talk uh, about uh, you know, the fact that you know, now once that issue is, is raised, how all the communication that happens as a result of that happens directly here in Revisto, right? So one of the main things of, of coordinating, you know, this inside of Revisto is that people do not have to leave this application, right? We're not, we're not working with emails and screenshots and PDFs and viewpoints. It's all one collaborative environment where these issues are all tied to the XYZ coordinate and where everybody is communicating in one spot. So if you maybe want yeah, to talk about the issue communication. That's exactly correct. So you've seen us place these stamps, right? As soon as I place a stamp, this gets automatically interjected into the issue tracker, along with the ability to comment. Now here, I can template this stamp out to go to a certain person, or I can even reassign it on the fly, right? So I can send that issue over to Greg. And then here, what we're looking at is our stamp view. But if I go back to the issue tracker, I can see that issue. I can see that Greg has already responded. He's already set the status to in progress. And this is all, now we're tying the communication back to the model, back to the scan, back to the drawings. And there is a very clear contextual conversation going on about what this problem is, how we're gonna resolve it, how we're gonna prevent that RFI, how we're gonna prevent that change order. And for the end user, it's very good because we can go in here <clears throat> and we can quickly edit a markup that has scan information in it. We can quickly see where that is and navigate the model for ourselves without having to use the time of a specialized person. We can see where that issue is on the drawing. Keep in mind, this is all still happening in Revisto. Right here, we're seeing, all right, we've got the existing condition, we've got the uh, model, we've got the detail. We now have the ability to send that issue out. <clears throat> oh, excuse me, let's go back. Took me back here. Just for, for so to recap what, what we're kind of seeing here, you know, for everybody that again is, is maybe new or, or seeing Revisto for the first time, it, this is, simply happening, it's, it's coordination and, and, and communication and issue tracking through the cloud 
However, Revisto itself is a is a localized application, right? So if if the thought around this is how is this all going to work, trying to, to go through you know an internet connection and what happens if things drop out, Revisto doesn't rely on the, the, the network connection itself. So whether you're out in the field in the office, this is happening locally on that device, right? So uh, it's it's allowing us to work even if we're offline. And then when we reconnect or if we are connected, all of that communication and any of these changes that happen, that does happen through the cloud. But it, again, it's all in one platform. We, we have not left it. We have not had to create a data silo. Everything is happening here. Absolutely. And, and what I always like to use this view for is if I were to do this in my old workflow, I would be in a conference room, first of all, I would have three applications open on three different screens, and I would be asking people that don't work with technology every day to bring this data together in your mind and make a crucial decision now, right? That's very difficult situation for everybody, the technical person, the engineers trying to make the decision, the construction professionals trying to make a decision. This brings it together to where everything is really linked together in that chain of communication. And we can look at it many different ways. So <clears throat> by way of merging this information together, we are really interjecting these scans with a lot of valuable info. Now, to really, you know, sort of uh, think about that. Now, keep in mind, everything from the issue tracker, reporting, all of that, is happening automatically. But another thing that we've been working on is our clash automation. Now, what's really important about clash automation is, is that you know, our view about how scans play into coordination do not go away when we were talking about clash. Um, it's something that we knew we were gonna have to tackle. So here, we can actually see our new clash automation uh, module here. And what I've done is, is I've actually gone in and created Clash Automation tests with all of this reality capture. Now we're not gonna dive into every aspect of Clash Automation because we are gonna do a webinar on it. But what I wanted to highlight was, is the fact that we now have the ability to actually see where we are clashing with these point clouds. Now we're working on our localization algorithms, but as you can see right there, even though it may have picked up this little piece of the scan up there, we can visually see exactly what that problem is and automatically group these together uh, in various ways. Greg, were you? was that you? I'm here. Oh, sorry. I thought I heard someone getting ready to talk, so I was gonna try no, not to go over. Uh, unfortunately, I'm the only one that can can speak here, but that's you know, that could be a good thing or a bad thing. But no, Brett, this is <laughs> this is massive, and I think you know I'm sure a lot of the people that that attended this um, were were very curious to see you know what we've done in the way of of this, right? Um, so, like Brett said, we're gonna we've we've already done a couple of them, and we'll do more you know webinar focused on on clash automation piece the the whole process and workflow, but just the simple fact of, of us being able to, you know, very, very shortly uh, be able to clash point clouds against the models is, is extremely powerful. Um, so Brett, maybe show a couple more examples uh, of that and, and just kind of the theory behind it. Yeah, absolutely. So this right here, and, and this is just showing the flexibility of the mesh and the scan, right? Like we can, we can do both, right? So, the first example, you are seeing the point cloud. The second example, you are seeing the mesh. So just kind of showing the flexibility, the ability to work with e you know, either system here. And the issue tracker works exactly the same for both. So you know, something that we did want to show. And what's really great about this is that, um, oh, let's go back here. Let's see. Here we go. We got some hits right here. It just simply allows you to pull this reality capture information in just like it was another model. And it really 
how can I put it? Um, because for people that don't live and breathe BIM, all this is is just visuals for them to make decisions around. And if we can simplify that for our end users to where they're not concerned about what type of information this is, and they're more concerned about what am I seeing? What do I understand about this problem? I think we'll all be in a better place using reality capture moving into the future. For sure. And, and Brett, um, curious, like, based on this, uh, our, our ability to clash uh, reality capture against model, like, do you, do you see this being used more for like, you know, TI and, and renovations? Do you see it for, for, you know, new builds just to, to grab the existing conditions or, or the as built the progress of it and then compare it to, you know, what the BIM model says, or do you see them valuable in both scenarios? What maybe speak to that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in my situation, for everyone in the room, I come from an industrial EPC. I didn't work on a project in the seven years prior to my employment here that did not have some form of existing condition that we had to contend with. Um, so scanning for me has been really a way of life for the last decade. And in my opinion, we scanned every job. We did greenfield projects so that we could understand the civil topo. Um, and we did retrofit industrial projects so we could understand the inside of the building. Um, I think moving forward, one of the biggest feedbacks that, that we've received and we're working on a development for this is to put a not clashing modifier um, in the clash test so that people can then begin to verify if something is where it needs to be or not. Now, we, want, we aren't going to get into like deviation reporting or anything, um, at least not at this moment, but it is a great way to do a cursory check of, hey, did they install this in the field? Yes or no. So that's a, one good example, right? Another good example would be you know, uh, what existing services are going to remain in service from a safety issue, right? Like one of the big things in my old job was, hey, don't get electrocuted. You know, there's tons of high voltage laying around everywhere. Be very wary of that. Uh, those are things that we can interject with the scan uh, to improve safety conditions for people that are looking at this, you know, on an iPad. So tons of different use cases really for for everybody that's involved in this project. Again, not, not just, you know, with, the, with our typical issue tracking process, but as you're seeing here, you know, the, the, the different ways that we're able to incorporate and use the point clouds and, and compare that to the model and clash it. So um, just really speaks to the, to the breadth of what Revisto offers. And, and again, the fact that it's all in one collaborative cloud-based environment. Absolutely. You know, and, and Revisto 5, even though this is, uh, you know, a year old at this point, I mean, the thing to keep in mind is, is that once Revisto is used as your federation environment, you can then start to use the other utilities, such as the appearance profiles, to quickly break down the model into what you need. Get rid of the scan when you don't need it, bring it back when you do need it, and just have that general flexibility of reviewing not only on an ongoing basis and collaborating, but using this in live meetings to make people understand the points that you're trying to make uh, in context of all the information that you're using. Right. No, it makes perfect sense, Brett. And um, there's a lot of great chatter conversation going on in the in the in the chat aspect of it. Um, and I do I do think people uh, have some questions around you know what are what are some of the tools that can be used to, you know, to getting this data in, right? You know, what, what kind of tools create the mesh? What are we able to use? I, I see some, you know, some Sintu references, some point fuse references. So Brett, maybe just take a, a quick step back and um, explain a little bit how, how it ultimately comes into Revisto and how some of those other tools are incorporated into this process. Yeah, absolutely. So as of right now, we'll start with our direct imports, right? So, and this is where a lot of this information will be coming from. Whenever I import, I have the option for these sorts of cloud bay or point cloud files, right? We do RCP, RCS, FLS, FWS, LS project, 
LAZ and LAS. So this covers a, a big breadth of terrestrial scanners, drone flights, LIDAR, all of that can really be contained in here. Um, however, you know, obviously you have to have some sort of post-processing point cloud. We do not go directly from the scanner to our software. It has to be processed and seen or cyclone or recap, one of those two. But once that's done, that's how we get that information out of that silo. We put it into Revista. Um, as you can see, we also have an OBJ format, FBX format for the meshes, as well as IFC, 12D, some other ones right here. So this is one big way that scans are going to get in. But we do take scans directly in from our direct plugin. So if you have a scan correctly positioned in Revit, you can bring it in directly from Revit. If you have it correctly positioned in any of our software, you can bring it in from that software. So I think that that's, that's really important. Um, now, the way that these are created, right? So your general RCP is obviously going to be created in something like Recap, right? Where we can bring them together, generate an RCP, and export it. Now, the meshes, there are a lot of different options there. Sin2 does a really great job of not only acting as a repository for your scans, but also as a way to generate meshes automatically from the cloud. This really reduces the workload to get those meshes out, although there is less control with those meshes as there is with the software like PointFuse, which has really gone the route of turning meshes into uh, BIM data. So point right. fuse is for those people that really want to say, this is a door, this is a wall. So there's a lot of different options on the meshing side of things. And it's really rapidly increasing in use cases and players in the market. Yeah, and I think that really helps, you know, people obviously have a great deal of, you know, they, they, they're excited about this. They want to understand, you know, how quickly and how easily data can, can get into Revisto. So, you know, appreciate you you kind of shedding some more light on that um you know and again we've got some some great questions here um you know one, one of the the users asked again you know can we see annotate measure using any web browser is this just standalone as a reminder this is a standalone application but yet it, it is you're collaborating through the cloud right so if, if in case you didn't see when we share that project this project and we invite people they get that automatic and immediate access to, to, to whatever you're seeing, not whatever you're seeing, but they, they have this same project, right? So it, the collaboration happens through the cloud, but yet the when you downloaded it, it, it's locally to whatever machine you're viewing it on, not, not a web browser. Yep, so uh, there's another question in here. It's like, what is the recommended process and software slash apps used for scanning with an iPad Pro and taking that scan to Revisto. So Andy's going to be very happy with this question because I'm going to recommend Sitescape for this. Um, I've been using Sitescape on my iPad, uh, my iPhone. I did some uh, scans at uh, RCN with it. Uh, in my opinion, it is one of the better iPad collection tools. Uh, while there is a few of them, the thing about Sitescape is, is we're working towards a few direct paths to get that information in. But right now you can simply open up those native uh, PLY files in recap and import those as an RCP, um, or there's a couple other softwares. But we have been in contact with that particular vendor and are looking at what file formats would work best to go directly from that iPhone into Revisto. So it's something that we hope that's coming in the future. But right now, you would have to take that uh, scan out of out of Sitescape, put it into one of the formats that we're using, and, and import that. But it is possible, and we see people using it all the time. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if there's one thing about you know us as a as a company and a technology provider is that we, we want to do everything in our power to allow whatever our customers need to come in and allow whatever our customers need to get out. And not that we have the answer to everything uh, right as we speak today, but it's something that is obviously a huge development focus for us at all times, right? We wanna be that central place. We want customers to be able to push and pull whatever data they need 
um, and, and be able to share it with whomever they need. So that, that is a constant focus for us. Um, and Brett Matt asked an interesting question too. Can scans be converted into Revit models that they can then bring back into Revit or does it all stay in Revisto? So maybe speak to that. Yeah, so one of the big difficulties that we had, especially with the RCP, not so much with the mesh, is that we had to bring it into a proprietary format to enable the mobile use. So if you need to scan in Revit, that workflow is going to be put the RCP in Revit, put the RCP in Revisto, not put the RCP in Revisto and then pull that RCP into Revit. We uh, have talked about things that we could potentially do in the future, but those are all theories at this point. So uh, as of right now, that is how it's going to function. Right. Yeah, and, and speaking of, you know, uh, kind of positioning and, and coordinates and all that. So Pat and, and Patrick and, and Shannon, you know, raised the question around, you know, how do you, what, what's the best methods of positioning it inside of Revisto? So, you know, again, for, for everybody that is not aware of, of Revisto 5 now is, you know, you do have the ability to relocate models, position them as you need, set them to whatever coordinate system you want. In the past, we, we had to rely on how that data came in. Now it's totally different, allows you guys the, the flexibility to make those changes to the coordinates and reposition whatever you need to. Um, yep. So Brett can maybe show and, and talk a little bit more in detail about that. Yeah, absolutely. When we set out to make Revisto a, an environment that people can directly federate in, we knew that transform would be something that ha would have to be there. So I can take this scan, I can set up a transform, I can set up the origin, I can say, you know, I want rotation around a, a custom point, you know, I can uh, set that point, and then I can set degrees around a vector, change um, any of this rotation aspect, all of that. So everything can be changed in here, and we'll see obviously woo, flew at me. I thought I was going the other way with it. We can see that separate, right? So I do that. I come back in, scene transform, take everything back to zero. And then we're positioned back in the right spot. I can do that with any file in the object tree. So we do understand for people that aren't generating their own information, that that is something you you probably will have to do, and that capability is there. Yeah, for sure. And with what this obviously allows for you know the customers to do is is have that flexibility to to make the necessary adjustments here and not have to necessarily rely on various sources that that are going to enter different data into Revisto at different times and and hoping that they all come in as uh, as one you know conjoin family. So now with Revista, you've, you've got the ability to make whatever changes you need to. Absolutely. So I think, right. I think we made it through um, all the questions in the chat. Um, I'm just doing a quick scan here. If anybody else has any uh, additional questions, feel free to, to type them into the chat now or on the actual Q&A uh, function. Um, but before wrapping up, um, Brett, any, anything else specifically that we would want the audience to know um, that just kind of further cements Revisto as being able to leverage our, our reality capture features as, you know, as in aiding with coordination? Yeah, the, you know, the, the one thing is, is that um, I, I really suggest that everyone, even if you're not going to implement um, any sort of advancement in reality capture, uh, you know, based on what you've been doing for the last three to five years, is at least give a look to these other software vendors, you know, send to point fuse, those are those are two of my favorites, uh, personally. Um, I see Max is in the chat as well. Max has got a very, very interesting uh, application that allows all this information to get into, uh, you know, a large uh, uh, multi-user room type scenario in his full Max 3D system. 
So that's another, you know, very much uh, valuable aspect to this whole context thing, right? Um, you know, Dominique's in the chat too. He'd be willing to talk to anybody about what Sin2 does. I really think it's worth a look for everyone that's looking at potentially utilizing these meshes. Um, and, and I hate to revert to a technical question, but I see Brian had a question. I want to get to Brian's question here. Um, he asked, what is the tolerance of going from the scan to the mesh? Um, this is all based on what software you use to create the mesh. And both of the softwares that I just mentioned have a way to dial in how much that mesh is tessellated based on the points. So once again, something that Brian, you could definitely ask uh, two of those vendors as well as some of their other competition out there uh, exactly what you're looking for. Yeah, thanks for uh, for grabbing. I, I missed that question, Brett. It was further up the chat that I didn't scan to. So yep, got good, good catch on that. So. And uh, I'm sure that the other uh, folks in here that uh, are part of the other technology providers appreciate the, the shout outs there. Um, and, and actually, Chris Brown asked as well, can you transform and align to a measurement like in Navisworks, you know, matching an angle or an orientation of geometry with scan data? Not yet. It is, it is an advancement to our transform command uh, that, that we are trying to work in. And a lot of that is based on how do we build a visual widget in, you know, inside of our software. So it's something that we know that needs to come but um, we're just not there quite yet. Right. All right, well, um, we are just about at, at 45 minutes here. Wanted to be mindful of everybody's time and, and not uh, take up too much of your day, but hopefully this was jam packed with, with information uh, about how you can better coordinate here inside of Revisto, not just with reality capture, but um, just, you know, in general. Um, so thanks everybody uh, for your time. And if there's no other questions, we will uh, we'll go ahead and wrap things up. One last one actually coming in, Brett. Um, wondering about the, Christian was wondering about the navig navigation cube um, to be able to check your location. So a couple of different ways that we can orient orientate ourselves in the model? Ah, uh, yes. So um, one thing is, is that uh, let's say down at the bottom, you'll see the XYZ. This has been a, a recent addition. Um, I can also go over here to our new view tool and choose a top, bottom, left, right, front, back view, predetermined view, and immediately get taken to that view. So it's not exactly a view cube, but fulfills the same purposes. Um, and the other thing too is, is that it is interactive with objects. So if I dive in here and I select, you know, a specific object, let's go over here. Oh, wrong side. I should know this project better. But uh, if I select that object and I say, you know, top view, it gives me a top view of that object. Awesome. So, and we've also got, you know, an intelligent map functionality, again, for those that are newer to Revisto, to just be able to get that, you know, quick and dirty, you know, top down view of, hey, where am I in relation to this? Um, you've got that the little blue icon that tells you where you're currently at. And then you'll notice on the right hand side, it allows you to cut by level. Um, so depending on how that model comes in and how it's structured, you can quickly cut through particular levels and, and essentially hop from one spot to the next by, by simply single clicking on where you want to go. Yep, great for navigation in the field. Yep. For Which someone really... to be able to say, here's where I'm located and I want to jump over to the skid, very powerful. Yeah, I think one of the, one of the main things that we always hear about getting field adoption and buy-in from for tools like this is, to be able to get to, to a certain spot without having to do too many clicks or get lost and, and having to navigate a massive model. So these are really nice shortcuts that allow those people to, to get to a, a particular uh, location very quickly. Um, and then also, Brett, 
you know, Orchelon is wondering about size limitations, you know, when that, you know, to, to upload that RCP in, in the, into Revisto, you know, maybe talk about the, the flexibility there and, and, and how, you know, does it slow it down significantly? Does it maintain its performance? Yeah, so that is, it's a really good question. And that's why this dialogue comes into play. So someone asked, how do I switch between the mesh and the scan? And a lot of it is with these presets that select the files that I want. So if you notice, if I go to scan, it unselects the mesh. And if I go to mesh, it unselects the scan. These are presets that can be sent out. Now, to the question of the size is that absolutely, there are going to be limitations. Most of it is based on how much do I have a solid state drive? Do I have a good GPU? And do I have a decent processor? So the answer to limitations is actually pretty all over the place, right? <laughs> like, you know, if I'm using an 11900K and an RTX 3090, I can handle 180 gigs, 200. If I'm using, you know, a Chromebook from five years ago, I can handle one. Right. Um, so a lot of it depends on how much information do you have in there? What I would suggest is for anybody looking to do a large scanning project in Revisto is that you bring the scans in, in, in areas, right? We can handle a project with 500 gigs of scan data. You just can't show it all at once. If that makes sense. So it would be a situation, say we were doing a campus project. You may have, you know, uh, levels one through 10 of three different buildings in here. And you always just make sure that you have turned on uh, what you want to process. And this is what en enables us to do very large projects and get that all out to the team. And everyone can see what they need because they're only looking at what they need to look at to do their job. Exactly. And kind of a separate spinoff from from the, the processing power, you know, something that is often a point of interest for people is, you know, how to leverage this from a, a VR environment, you know, and, and Josh, um, you know, mentions or asks about like Oculus. Josh, I mean, we we have direct compatibility with both the Oculus Rift and the HTC Vive. Um, and that's, you know, when you when you put a project in Revisto, it'll not only go to the Revisto 5 kind of general uh, application, it, it mirrors that project across the, the, the VR viewers that would come with an automatic download um, to that. So yeah, we, we do support uh, viewing in, in Oculus. So no, the talk is not at least another hour. Um, and then Viviana asks about, you know, resources where she can look into keyboard shortcuts. Uh, Viviana, a lot of information is right on our website. There is actually a, a help center um, on the main page of our website that will give you whatever access you need to, to all that information. Yep. Go to uh, our Revisto help and just type in uh, a keyboard shortcuts and a big old diagram will show right up. Yep. And Max says VR in the BIM cave with full Max is also supported. Absolutely. Always is, Max. Thanks yeah. for showing up, bud. Yeah. The, um, you know, Chris says, I assume breaking down your scans will also help with ease of making your search selection sets for clashing. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. The, the, the answer to that question is yes. <laughs> um, and what's funny, before we go, for anyone that just wants kind of a final anecdote about VR, is when I was at RCN, I had a conversation of, if you bring reality capture into VR, is it AR? <laughs> so I'll leave everyone with Thank that. You go. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> because ultimately with VR, you can bring the site to the people in the office, make uh, less travel. You don't have to worry about safety sensitive situations. There's a lot of value in the VR uh, reality capture merging that we've done here. So not something I planned on talking about today, but definitely uh, worth mentioning based on the questions.
Absolutely. Well, Brett, uh, phenomenal job as always. Thanks for, uh, for all your good insight. Uh, everybody that's still here, thanks for, for joining. Um, as a reminder, this session is automatically recorded and will get sent to everybody that not only attended but registered. So thanks so much for everybody's time. We are almost to the top of the hour, so we, we got a jet, but uh, appreciate it. And uh, we'll look forward to hearing from you guys soon. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate Take your care. time.